Hey there. What I thought we would do today is I would present to you a sample from my online course, Applied Developmental Psychology. So you can go ahead and enroll in the course. Just follow the link somewhere in the description for this video. Otherwise, sit back and enjoy this sample talk. All right, so in this lecture, we're going to be talking about the first picture in the 10 oxen pictures. And that is searching. So one thing to understand, first of all, is that to even arrive to even begin this stage is actually something very rare. Most of the time, the majority of people, the vast majority, spend their lives going from one thing to the next. They are sort of at the will of the winds. They sort of take life as it comes. They sort of just gratify whatever it is that is coming along to them and whatever it is that's in them. To actually sense that there's something more, to have the intuition of something bigger, of something beyond, is rare. It's actually something very much overlooked as a gift. And when you actually do go on this journey, when you actually do make your way through the stages of the 10 oxen pictures, you realize on a deeper and deeper level how lucky it is that you've found the path that you've discovered, that you found what you've found. And that, of course, leads in later on to an immense, grat uh, an immense gratitude, which is also related to existential gratification. So... It is difficult to appreciate just how lucky each of us are to find the path. And one of the ways in which the traditional scriptures describes this or sort of equates for this is that they say, well, they are the chosen people, the chosen ones for whatever reason, whether it's chosen by God or chosen by the universe or chosen by whatever it is to come forth. And that sort of story of being chosen, of being special, of having received something that is exclusive, that doesn't actually come along every day, that actually only comes along once in a lifetime, that is a key component of this stage. That is a key dynamic. And the way in which these stories of God's chosen people try to illustrate that is, well, through narrative. And you can say that, well, maybe it's a bit misleading some of the stories that they tell. Maybe it's not such a helpful thing, but that's just a bit of a sense of where that idea comes from, where that sense comes from. Now, remember, when we're talking about the personal experience, we're really talking about arriving at the gratification of your place in existence, which means that you want to be feeling good about what existence is, feeling good about having been born. And that is something that we'll expand on. Now, a lot of the time, we're, we're not concerned with such things, right? Most of the time, we're concerned with the mundane, the petty, the day-to-day -day activities, the tasks and duties, the running of life, the going from one thing to another, from just working out, well, what it is that's around me now and what I have to work on, right? We have our work, we clean our teeth, we do these things that are, in every sense, just mundane. And when something passionate comes up, when something impulsive comes up, then we gratify it. 
And that's the level that we largely stay on. So searching, searching is that point where you begin to see beyond that. You actually begin to see that it's not working. It's not enough. And here we arrive at one of the foundational principles of this first stage in the 10 oxen pitches. It's one of the key qualities, and this is to do with desire. And at this first stage, there is an immense dissatisfaction. There's no gratification. There's no fulfillment. There's no feeling good about what you've got. There's just this downright fed up attitude with everything. Now, this is a little bit tricky, right? Because it's such a negative thing. It's such a thing that would normally be like frowned upon, right? You say, enjoy your life, feel good about your life, right? And yet here in this model, it's actually saying, no, you need to be dissatisfied. And this is with everything, right? So everything that you do, every place that you go seems hollow. It seems like it's not giving you the kick. It's not giving you the flair. The people that you talk to are sort of shallow. The people that you listen to don't have any depth. There's no resonance in what people say, in what you read, in what you study. And that sort of... that sort of negative feeling, that like collapse of meaning, that collapse of feeling good about everything is normally something we resist. It's normally something we actually say, no, I want to get away from that. I want to be open to the good things in life. I want to have the simple pleasures. I want to have the good life. I want to move towards goodness and away from pain, towards pleasure, away from pain. It's quite counterintuitive that actually... This dissatisfaction is the beginning of a momentous leap into something new. It's actually something that needs to go beyond, that actually needs to push into something further. Now, another way to look at this is through openness. Okay, now we've talked about openness in a number of different ways, in a number of different forms. And here we can put it like this. You've got passive openness and active openness. So searching, stage one, is an active openness. Now, when we're open to things and we're passive, we can say, well, we're taking life as it comes, right? We're just doing the easy way. We're just doing, well, if someone offers me something, I'm going to go for it. If I find something in a new situation, I'm going to try it. If I'm going to do something with someone, then I'll do that. There's a sort of degree of openness there, right? And even even that, <laughs> even that is actually quite important to have, right? Because we can say that the majority of people aren't open at all. The majority of people are just trying to maintain what they are and maintain their feelings and uphold their states and their habits and their sense of being unconsciously, right? So even to be passively open is a step above being open, being closed, sorry, rather. So to go beyond that, though, we have to say, what does it mean to be actively open? And that is searching. That is actually going out there to do new things, to try new things. And with that, with that kind of openness, when you're trying the things that you've always tried, and even when you're starting to try new things, and it's not working, and it's not gratifying, it's not giving that sort of spark, that sort of flair, that sort of freshness that you want, there's a deep dissatisfaction, there's a deep frustration with everything. So now is probably a good time for me to read the sutra. So I'll read this comment that goes along with this first picture, and we'll see what it has to say about being satisfied. So, number one, the search for the bull. 
In the pasture of this world, I endlessly push aside the tall grasses in search of the bull, following unnamed rivers lost upon the interpenetrating paths of distant mountains, my strength failing and my vitality exhausted, I cannot find the bull. I only hear the locusts cheering through the forest at night. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this talk. I'd just like to remind you that this is a sample that comes from my online course, Applied Developmental Psychology. So if you want to go deeper, if you'd like to find out more, you can go ahead and enroll in the course. Thanks very much. And let's get back to the talk. So to get to our core threads and to sort of say, OK, well, we have this dissatisfaction. What are we going to do with it? How are we going to be actively open and searching? We can go like this. The mind at the searching stage is operating under this assumption that it needs to push to its limits all of the parameters that it has known, all of the things that are familiar to it and all of the things that are at home need to be expanded. It needs to be pushed out. So the mind at this level wants information. It wants an, an excess of information, right? So you're going to have a, a larger expanse of knowledge, of stories, of explanations, of concepts. And that's going to become a rolling process, right? And things like your cognitive ability will expand, which means you'll be able to form longer sentences. You'll be able to hold multiple ideas in mind at once. You'll be able to make deep connections, things, right? This is the multidimensional mind, just like at stage yellow on spiral dynamics, right? That assumption, the assumption that's behind that is that, okay, we have the mind and it's got these complexes. How do I bring them to their extreme? How do I burst them out into their larger things, right? So that's the mind when searching. And there is a dissatisfaction in that because more information doesn't necessarily mean transcending the mind, right? A bigger mind, a bigger amount of content does not necessarily mean the stumbling upon the realization that you actually have to go beyond that and you actually have to let go of that. You actually have to change the exact mechanics of the mind. Now, when we come to being and to sort of expand upon this dissatisfaction, the same thing happens with the mind, right? We have these experiences which are connected to the actions that we do or the meditations that we do or the practices that we do or the situations that we're in, right? The connection between the external and the internal. And we're starting to change those mechanics. So we're seeing that the connection doesn't work, right? It doesn't matter if you're in a certain place, you might be happy or you might be sad. It doesn't matter if you do a certain meditation, you might feel good or you might feel bad. It doesn't matter if you do a certain thing, then you might feel good or feel bad, right? So that connection is very much broken apart, right? Now, of course, before searching, before all this, you're operating under this assumption that, well, if I just get my actions and my environment and my situation and my thoughts all right, then I'll feel good, right? It's still under the assumption that I can feel good by making the external world fit into a certain way, right? But at this stage, at searching, you already know that there's a disconnect there and there's a frustration, right? There's a, there's a turmoil because you can't create a certain feeling within you. You can't find something within you. Now, remember, when we're searching, we're actually searching for not only knowledge and the nature of the mind, but the experience 
the being, what it means to be. And it's something new. It's something that you haven't encountered before. So you're taking all the things that you've been and you're pushing them to the extreme. You're trying to get that feeling as deep and as large as you can. So if you've been creative, you're going to be very creative, right? Stage yellow at Spiral Dynamics, very creative, huge explosion of creativity. When you're searching and you're being creative, then that's pushed to its extreme. This also goes for realization, for having the new experiences come along and that actually turns into an experience of itself, right? The the arriving at a new feeling that can even turn into a thing into itself, which is a kind of frustration, right? How do I go beyond the newness, right? Because finding something new and then finding another thing new and then another thing new actually turns into a string of experiences, which then is sort of like a, it's sort of like an emergent experience or a epiphenomenon on the experiences. And that recognizing that is not enough at stage one, at searching. So that's a little bit about the state of being at searching. Now, when we get to perception, the same rule applies as for the mind and the being, which is that you want to look at lots of things, right? You want to take in to the extreme, the perceptions in their deepest form, right? So you're looking at lots of new things. You're looking at profound things, right? So you're going to start to turn away from the screen and look at nature. You're going to look at things that are beautiful. You're going to be appreciating subtle things in culture and in art and in creations, artifacts of different people, of the humanities. You're going to want to see grand openings in nature. You know, you're going to want to look at the big, the Grand Canyon, the Niagara Falls. And that's also going to change into a subtlety, right? You're going to start to see the beauty in just one flower. The beauty in just one leaf on a tree, which has thousands of leaves, right? So this is still all tied in with and very much related to stage yellow at the spiral dynamics level. And that's searching, right? You're really going to be listening for things as well. You're really going to be wanting to taste things. And even in that, right, there's going to be a dissatisfaction. Even in that, you're not quite going to be able to get to, well, this thing that you really want. Now, to move on to meditation. When you're meditating in a search, searching sort of way, it is very much possible and <laughs> in some ways likely that you're meditating with some idea of what it is you're going to find or experience or feel. And of course, this is a rookie mistake, right? This is a beginner's mistake. If you have some idea of a peak experience or a breakthrough or enlightenment, then your idea is just your idea. And to try and find that, to actually want to pursue that and to go after that is is quite naive because you're actually trying to find something that, first of all, you can't create for yourself. And second of all, you don't know what it's like. You don't have any reference as to what it could be like and how would you recognize it if it did come along, right? So this problem of having something completely new, something that's completely foreign, is very much prevalent in the searching stage. Now, to sort of say, well, what meditation should I do? You would say that at this stage, witnessing is the best meditation. And... There's a number of techniques that you can do to put you in touch with that component of consciousness. And the most common one of those would be the body scan. So when you center your 
awareness or your concentration into a point and then start to observe the body, the sensations in the body, that is a process that then puts you into the witness because you start to see, well, the body is separate to something else. It is a component within a larger space. And the thing that can see that is the witness. It's the thing that can actually go beyond the body and the mind. So that's also what we see at stage yellow, right? The ability to to differentiate the mind and the body that's occurring here at searching. So the body scan is probably the, the best prescription for searching. And that is, well, what is it that I'm searching for? Now, one thing that can sort of be it sort of can be tied into this one sort of meditative practice that can be tied into this, but is in in many ways, now that I think about it, a bit of a trap. And that is introspection. So when you're thinking about thoughts and you're thinking about ideas and you're contemplating and you're actually thinking about, well, what what position do I want in life? What do I want from my life? What do I want to do with my life, these sorts of introspective questions, that's different to the actual experiencing, right? The inquiring into the experience. Introspection and contemplation is still at the level of the mind. So that would go along with trying to push the parameters of the mind out to its extremes. And those those are two different things, right? So you've got contemplation and the body scan or inquiry into the sensations that you're having. So really, you don't want to be contemplating at this stage. Searching is not about contemplation. It's not about forming your identity. It's not about forming your role in society. That's that's long back in the past. That's, That's something you have to have already taken care of. Now, of course, if you haven't taken care of it, you do need to practice it, right? It's an important component of your experience as a human being. So, if it's dealt with, then you can move on to it to this, but if it isn't, then go back to it. So that, that's the distinction there. Now, to talk about the relaxation of searching, and this sort of ties back in with the dissatisfaction, right, of searching, the, the disgust with everything, the the fed up attitude. When you're searching, it's near impossible to relax. It's near impossible to actually go out and get things and find those new experiences without a real clench, without a real determination. Now, this does tie in with autonomy, right? And we have to look at this and we will look at this through the next few stages. Autonomy is that drive. It is that clench because you have to say, well, what is it that's pushing you beyond this dissatisfaction? What is it that's actually wanting you to go beyond? What is it that's giving you the determination and the strength to say, okay, well, I'm dissatisfied with everything. I have to do something about it. Many people do actually get stuck in that stage, right? Many people are dissatisfied and they don't have the strength to go on to it. And when I talk about relaxation, you know, I also have to draw in to sort of help flesh out this idea of autonomy, the idea of effort or the idea of exerting a will exerting energy onto something. And when you're searching, you have to exert energy. You have to exert your will. You have to enforce your will. And there's an incredible clench in that. There's an incredible inability to relax, right? Someone who's in that stage, they're they're always working. They're always traveling. 
They're always acting. They're always, they're always motivated. They're always at this high sort of intensity of like determination, right? It's almost like they've got this surplus of motivation. And that's basically the quintessential opposite of relaxation. When we talk about, you know, when your body is relaxed and you're sitting and you're not doing anything and the muscles are completely limp. Well, here at Searching, we have the opposite, right? The, the muscles are engaged. And that occurs at every level, right? It's not just the physical body. It's not just the muscles of the biology that you're encapsulated in. It's also the exerting of the mind, right? Really being determined to think, right? So you can exert yourself physically, but you can also exert yourself mentally, right? How do I think this through? And further still, you can do that with your being like, how do I get this feeling? How do I get this feeling? How do I find that that emotion or that sort of experience within me, right? Further still, it happens with the perception, right? If you really want to look at something, you really, how do I see it, right? People at the searching stage might develop this thing of the keen eye or the it's almost like the evil eye, but for everything, right? If you talk to someone, then they're really going to listen to you. They're really going to look at you like, what are you saying? I really want to know, right? That's something we see at stage yellow in Spiral Dynamics. And that clenching, that ex exerting is is the the opposite of relaxation, right? It's a kind of opposite of passive openness, right? So this paradox of exerting energy and being dissatisfied with everything still has to tie in with openness as a passive sort of experience and an active sort of experience. Now, this is required. This is a requirement. This is something you have to go through to get from searching stage one to the second stage, you have to have that that attitude. You have to have that experience of really saying, okay, how do I push my mind to its limits? How do I push my body to its limits? How do I push my experience to its limits? How do I push my perceptions to its experience? Like, how do I really see as deeply as possible how do I really push into the absolute limits of sight? How do I hear as clearly as possible? How do I touch as sensitively as possible, right? With as much sensitivity as possible, with as much detail as possible, right? That, that exertion, that sort of push, that, th this all comes under the category of searching. It all comes under this first stage of the 10 oxen pitches, which is searching. So many people do not reach this. Many people don't understand that that exertion is something that needs to be adopted and it needs to be gone through, right? Just like we adopt the different numbers or types on the Enneagram for some time, we do the same thing with these stages on the 10 oxen pitches. How do I search, right? There's a thirst right? To really want something, you have to be thirsty for it, right? Hunger is a good practice for understanding desire. Fasting is actually one of the things that can put you in touch with your desire. It can give you that sensation of, right? It's, it's deep inside, this yearning. And that's what's needed for this stage, which is the first stage of the 10 oxen pitches. So, to sort of bring this all together and to sort of just bring this into a practical course of action, the question or the, the leading sort of inquiry is, what are you dissatisfied with? And to really 
get into the sense of searching for something beyond, for something profound, the answer to that question is you're dissatisfied with everything. Many people arrive at that after trying many things. That's another way to come at this, right? You can actually try something and if you really observe it, some sort of hedonistic gratification or some sort of project or some sort of experience or some sort of place, whatever it is, a relationship, whatever it is, you could try it and you can see the dissatisfaction. You can notice the dissatisfaction. You can sense the dissatisfaction. Now, so much of life is actually poised against that, right? So much of in life is, is just set up to deny any sense of dissatisfaction. That, that, that would be in so many ways the worst thing to suggest. To suggest that what someone's doing is dissatisfying is to have to admit that the whole direction you're going in is wrong. It's a waste of time and it needs to change, right? To suggest that what someone did is not the best thing in the world and not really that good is really quite hurtful. To say that about their project or their relationship or their family or their idea of who they are, who they are or their beliefs right? Their values, their being qualities, their creative acts, right? This is where the creative being side comes into it. You can actually look at, well, I've created something that's a being value. That's normally considered quite a high value, right? Creativity. What's the dissatisfaction in that? What's the the, the hollowness the emptiness in that. Because of course it is perfectly possible to create something and to be dis- dissatisfied with it. To feel that it's it really wasn't all it was cracked up to be. And of course this is explosive. This is core. Like people's desire, what someone desires is very much core to who they are. It's very much core to their motivations. And so much of the time, we're just holding that in place, right? We're walking around with this sense of, isn't life simple? If I could just get this thing, if I could just do this thing, then everything will be fine. Everything will be good. And then, of course, well, you actually do get it. You actually do have it. You achieve what you set out to achieve. And then, of course... The obligation is to say, well, it worked. I was satisfied. I was gratified. So everything's underway. Everything's as I see it. The world works the way that I see it. Right? When you're sensing this dissatisfaction with everything in life, whether it's a creative project or a relationship, then you're actually starting to get into this stage of searching, which is the first stage of the 10 oxen pitches. So the leading question is, what are you dissatisfied? What are you not gratified by? What are you dissatisfied with? What was it that didn't quite go to plan for you in your life? And of course, you do have to be careful with this because it can be, (laughs) it can be its own rabbit hole, right? It's very much easy to say, okay, well, everything's meaningless. Everything's pointless. There's no point in finding something. There's no point in working on something. There's no point in active participation because I tried all these things and it didn't work. And that's a stage that many people get stuck at. That's a stage that many people live the rest of their lives at. But of course, lucky for us, we have this model. We have this explanation. We know that this is just the beginning of something. This is just the start. And the thing that is 
emerging out of searching is the next stage, which is finding the footprints. So in the next lecture, we will talk about what happens when you have recognized dissatisfaction and you've turned that into active searching, active openness, and you've explored that for some time. When you've done that for some time, we'll look at what emerges, what comes out. Now, remember, that involves pushing the mind to its limits, pushing your being to its limits, your being qualities, creativity, realization, experiencing. Also pushing your perceptions to their limits, seeing to the best of your absolute ability, listening to the best of your absolute ability, feeling to the best of your absolute ability, feeling and touching, and also meditating. Meditating to the point where you can sense the witness, when you know what it means to differentiate the mind, the body, the environment, and you're in that space. And of course, to do that, you do the body scan. We will talk about more techniques later on, but that's just one that is fundamental. So the second stage, finding the footprints, is what occurs once these components of searching have been explored and lived through for some time. So we will talk about finding the footprints in the next chapter. So when you're ready, you can finish up your notes or whatever it is that you're doing, and then we can head over to the next lecture, which will be the second picture in the 10 Oxen Pictures of Zen. Thanks for checking out this talk. I'll just remind you once again that this comes from my online course, Applied Developmental Psychology. So if you want to go deeper, if you really want to get into the depths of the mechanics and the understandings and really open yourself up to these truly amazing ideas and concepts, go on ahead and enroll in the course. There'll be a link somewhere in this video or this talk where you can find out more and you can actually enroll. So thanks very much. Have a beautiful day and I look forward to seeing you in the course.